Hey y'all, it's great to be with you all today. And um, today we're gonna be talking about um, cancer clusters in transdisciplinary research. This is a new session that we're bringing you all today, which we're really excited about. I know that Kato and I in preparing this have learned a lot and we're really excited to hear your responses and be dialoguing with you about the information that we share today. So the first question I wanna ask you is, um, and I'm gonna ask this in the form of a poll, um, is do you anticipate, pay, re, anticipate researching cancer in the future or are you already researching cancer? And then um, what aspects of cancer or I'll say more generally disease do you research or anticipate researching? And while you're answering that, I'm gonna go on to the next slide and um, that goes over the agenda and then we'll return back to this. So um, our agenda for today, first we're gonna talk about different ways to study cancer um, and you know, something you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with, but just kind of back out of the questions for a minute. And then um, we're gonna look at foundational concepts. Um, we'll look at two different case studies, one um, being looking at um, research around breast cancer, and two, we're gonna look at um, some specific uh, community-based research in Kettleman City. We'll engage in a discussion and then we'll have a closing. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share back the results. Uh, so we can see that you know one, one, of, one person here um, is doing cancer research. Um, pretty sure. And we have two people who are unsure um, about their future in cancer research. And um, we see that people are studying um, treatment, prevention, biology, and detection diagnosis. Um, oh, and there's so just so you all can see, can see that breakdown. Okay, so I asked this question because one of the interesting things that we found in the uh, work that we were doing is um, these uh, these sort of like, I would say political ways that cancer funding is broken down. So what you see here first is, you know, a breakdown of um, the Komen Foundation's funding profile um, in areas of investment um, over the years. Um, as I'm sure you know, Komen Foundation is one of the major funders of breast cancer research. Um, and we see that, you know, the amount that's going to treatment has increased. Um, you know, there's stuff, there's, there's money for survivorship and outcomes, um, biology. The thing that we really want to highlight, though, is that there's been some sort of, uh, a number of scholars have pointed out how there's not as much research funds that go into prevention um, and pre prevention and causes. And specifically thinking about prevention and causes, um, that may be environmental or social in nature. Um, we see similar, somewhat similar funding profiles. If we look at first, there's the Department of Defense breast cancer research, and then um, the NCI budget. Um, and this is again, this is that 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 one is more broad broadly defined. But here again, we see um, that funds for um, causes and prevention you know, really are a much smaller percentage than other areas. And all of these areas are, you know, obviously very important areas to fund, but, you know, a number of social science scholars have raised the question of why, why do we see much less funding kind of on the most front end of prevention um, and causes, again, particularly from social environmental causes. Um, and this is a great, I know you all have, you know, a lot of a lot of knowledge in this area. So I'm excited for, you know, your, to hear your expertise and perspectives on this when we get to the discussion. So that's just kind of like an opening provocation I wanted to make. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to move more into um, some intellectual tools that can help us to think about this provocation. Um, we'll be revisiting um, a concept we talked about previously, um, for those of you that were able to come to previous trainings, around individual versus systemic deficit. Um, we'll be looking at concepts such as the profit of cure, the exploitation of uncertainty, unequal exposure, and the precautionary principle. 
And so I'll be you know, defining the, all, these all as we go along. Okay, so the first thing I wanna go over is um, the difference between framing um, our thinking of disease, health inequity, um, health issues, as well as cancer um, as an individual problem versus as a systemic deficit. Um, when we frame something, any, any area really um, in health as an individual problem, the onus to solve it often falls upon the individual patient or you know, the, in, the doctor treating that particular patient. Um, and you know, a lot of our energy goes towards um, finding, finding solutions that are based on the individual. And that is an important area for intervention. Um, what often gets less attention are systemic deficits that may contribute to, um, to health, health, health inequity and um, phenomena such as cancer clusters. Um, the, the, the importance of systemic deficit is really increasingly being acknowledged. In fact, I was just in on a um, launch this morning for a UC-wide center for um, for health and climate change and equity and you know a lot of the work they were talking about saying that needs to happen is to examine more of these systemic deficits so for example they said you know it's it's up to health researchers and health professionals not just to treat people who say are having asthma problems but also to think about what policies can be instituted to to improve air quality so that we have less um, people walking in to the clinic with asthma or other, um, you know, other other diseases fueled by um, air pollution, and that this is part of what we need to be thinking about as the purview of health providers and health researchers. And so that's that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is like thinking about how we can do our research in more expansive ways that is bringing in new types of questions and new types of research partners in that process. So, um, you know, first thing we do want to point out is, is that there's been a number of um, researchers that have pointed out that solutions that require investment by the individual, such as like, you know, treatments, um, getting a mammogram, I mean, these things may be covered by health insurance, but ultimately it sort of is like an individual is making an investment in their own health care. Um, and these are also solutions that, um, generally speaking, people pay for. You have to pay money or your insurance pays money. Somebody is paid for these interventions um, if it's at the individual level. Um, if we're examining systemic deficits, and particularly if we're looking at social environmental issues, um, this doesn't often create um, profit, say, for a company or even you know, for you know, an NGO or something to, doesn't necessarily bring in fun, funding. Um, and it can lead to higher costs for corporations that may be otherwise, you know, working to support um, cancer research. And so we just want to, you know, and so, you know, we see this really acutely um, in, in breast cancer culture. Um, this is a book by Gail Sulik. There's um, called Pink Ribbon Blues, How Breast Cancer Culture Undermines Women's Health. There's another book written by Samantha King called um, Pink Ribbons uh, Inc., that um, really points out the ways that um, breast cancer in particular is subject to what they call pink washing. Um, that people get a lot of, will, get, will contribute a lot of money, a lot of um, you know, time and effort towards um, raising funds for certain, for, for breast cancer. And that money may not always go um, in like may not always end up in places where it may do the most benefit. Um, some have even pointed out how site um, companies that support um, breast this type of breast cancer culture are simultaneously um, putting out carcinogens into our environment. So in a sense, the same company may be putting carcinogens into the environment that may be causing higher rates of cancer while also investing in um, the, the putting funds towards treatment and or even towards um, treatment solutions that they then are getting paid for. So overall, um, you know, what we want to think about and we want to encourage people to think about are like the many, many factors that can Im impact breast cancer. And um, 
and how and thinking and looking at this, you know, this is just this is an image, um, you know, we're not going to go over every single thing on here. But the point is, you know, this is just looking at breast cancer. And we know, like, with any cancer, there are like an enormous amount of factors that can impact, um, you know, one's susceptibility. And we want to think about how can we have research models that more take that into account. Um, because as um, another scholar points out, um, Lachlan Jane, um, in, in their book, Malignant, How Cancer Becomes Us, they point out how cancer is not solely a biological phenomenon, but a politics with which to engage and struggle. And what they mean by that is that we need to look at the sort of more social, social, social cultural, and even economic factors that impact um, who gets cancer, who doesn't, who has access to good treatment, who doesn't, what areas of cancer um, are more heavily researched than others. And that this isn't just, these aren't just um, purely biological, purely sort of like esoteric research questions. I mean, these are very, you know, social, political questions. So one way, another, now I'll kind of be providing some like examples of how, um, of how this sort of can play out sometimes in, in research. Um, we were doing research on cancer clusters. And one of the really interesting thing we found was that a lot of the research was actually around um, deciding whether or not cancer clusters were quote unquote real. Um, were they a, a fact or just a feeling a community had? So a, a, a community may say, well, we think we're a cancer cluster because it seems like you know everyone's getting cancer here. We feel like we have higher rates. And, you know, we have, you know, these sort of toxins and contaminants that we see being released into our communities. Um, and a lot of, and instead of talking about that experience and that reality that people are living in and seeing that as, um, say, you know, val like valid knowledge along which we can triangulate other points of knowledge, um, research was being done to decide, like, to almost let, like sort of play with the definition of what constitutes a cancer cluster to decide is this real or not. And I will add, you know, if we look at the funding for those for who's funding these different types of studies, there's further questions to ask. And what we see this as is this can lead to something that is really endemic, I would say, to our, the, our relationship between science and culture right now, which is the exploitation of uncertainty. Um, often we all know that the scientific process is extremely complex. It is extremely hard to have sort of like that absolute certainty around complex phenomenon, you know, um, understanding the causes and prevention of cancer, of which is one. And that is just, um, that is just the nature of things. This is also true, I would add, you know, if we look at sort of like the, you know, causes and conditions of climate change. And yet we can see in our culture how that, ex that uncertainty is often exploited to undermine um, some of the good that scientific research could do. So in this case, um, you know, we often see in some of, in some cases, particularly when we have communities that may be working to try and um, remove certain pollutants that are in close proximity to where they live, um, any uncertainty around whether or not these pollutants um, are, di are directly impacting their health outcomes um, will be exploited, um, will be used. If you can't find that sort of like quote unquote smoking gun that directly links the two, um, it can be hard for those communities to use research to, um, you know, to justify removing those contaminants from their communities. So, um, so, you know, again, what we need to attend to is here we see this is a model of breast cancer causation um, where we can see, you know, this complexity and see how, you know, with all of these different factors, um, how can we possibly, um, at this point in time at least, provide that certainty that may sometimes, um, that seems to be like the standard to which um, communities need to reach to, de to demonstrate that something needs to be done more on the prevention side, aside from just getting people more mammograms and testing again, which is also very important, but you know, we can do more. Um, another, a concept that has emerged from the literature and that concept that we see implemented in other 
um, nations is what's called the precautionary principles. And I'll kind of read, you know, this paragraph. Um, and this is from an editorial in The Lancet, you know, quite some time ago. Um, but I think it still is, you know, is interesting for us to think about today. Um, we must act on facts and on the most accurate interpretation of them using the best scientific information. That does not mean we must sit back until we have 100% evidence about everything. Where the state of the health of the people is at stake, the risk can be so high and the cost of corrective action so great that prevention is better than cure. We must analyze the possible benefits and costs of action and inaction. Where there is a significant risk of damage to the public health, we should prepare to take action to diminish those risks, even when the scientific knowledge is not conclusive, if the balance of likely costs and benefits justifies it. And so this is, um, you know, this is essentially like another model for how we can think about um, how not just research is done, but how research is also communicated to a public, how research interacts with policy, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of explore another aspect of how um, the individual problem differs from systemic deficit model. So if we think about um, cancer prevention as an individual problem, this prevention can kind of be reduced down to increasing awareness and increasing access to mammographies, which again, very important, but only covers part of the problem. Um, a, a systemic deficit model um, encourages us to look at how dominant research modes can actually act to mask environmental and systemic re, um, causes or to prevent the um, moving forward with more systemic research. Um, so, you know, for a, a systemic deficit model for a research agenda would include finding ways to remove known and suspected carcinogens and endocrine disruptors from our environment. It would understand that prevention means changing the risk factors that we can change instead of claiming that a drug um, that may also have mild and serious side effects is sufficient. We found a really interesting model in from the California Breast Cancer Primary Prevention Plan. Um, they created a path to prevention and they have these five guiding principles um, that we just wanted to share with you. Um, one is that breast cancer is a societal issue and reducing risk requires systemic change. I would extend that to say like all forms of cancer are a societal issue. Um, to create a health is healthy society, we must address discrimination, racism, and inequity in power and access. Um, community wisdom is a valuable source of information and often highlights area that scientific research has not yet investigated. This one is particularly important when we talk about cancer clusters that are being identified by local communities. Again, it doesn't mean that they're getting all of the sort of biology or the sort of um, epidemiology right, but their lived experience does matter and is a site of knowledge that we need to think, take seriously rather than just thinking, how do we disprove that? Um, four, breast cancer risk, I would say like all cancer risk, is multifactorial. Interventions to reduce risk should be multifactorial. And finally, we do not need 100% certainty to act. So, you know, you can kind of see some resonances between the points I've been making and these guiding principles, and you'll see a, film, a few more here. Um, you know, they mentioned um, sort of like race and class and gender as very salient um, categories of analysis. And a lot of this is because, not necessarily because biology may be a part of it, um, but that biology exists because of sociocultural differences. And so um, we need to not just think about individual risks of cancer, but what are the disparities in terms of the exposure and harm? Um, so, you know, here are just some headlines that kind of remind us of um, how these disparities exist, you know, with across our own state and across the nation. We see one, one headline telling us people of color are more likely to be harmed by pesticides. Another US oil refinery spewing cancer causing benzene into, into communities. And then another pesticides and environmental injustice in the US root causes current regulatory re regulatory reinforcement and a path forward. Um, so 
Um, now I'm going to pause and I want to ask you all another question. I'm going to put this in a poll. I'm just curious of all of these sort of pieces that, I, that I've presented at this point, which aspects resonate with you the most? Um, I'll go ahead and put that poll up. And you should be able to answer more than one. Um, but you can see the choices are this idea of the individual versus systemic approach. Um, the second one is, well, mix them up there, but exploitation of uncertainty. So essentially like maybe not following through on particular um, solutions um, because, of, because there still exists some uncertainty. Um, the next one, looking at the role of profit motive, say particular light like in the way funding is structured or at least taking that into account in the way we ask our research questions. Next, um, exploring environmental or systemic causes. And then finally, looking at disparities in exposure. So I'll give you all you know, another minute to fill those out. And while you do, I'm just going to, um, actually, I'm gonna go ahead and share these results now because you're all done before we move on to kind of like the next part. Um, so you can see here that um, everyone here is really interested in this concept of the exploitation of uncertainty, and I think that absolutely makes sense. We've seen, um, you know, really through the pandemic, we've seen how this is, you know, very dangerous, and I think that's true in all, all areas of science um, and something I hope to explore more in the future. Um, we see two of you are interested in disparities of expo in exposure, and there's at least one of you here interested in individual versus systemic approaches, role of profit motive, and exploring environmental and systemic causes. So that's great. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna kind of, I've been talking about using kind of like breast cancer as like a one case study to think about broadly how research is done. Now I'm gonna turn to another case study looking at Kettleman City. And this is more of an example of like moving towards a solution to these problems. So many of the challenges that we saw over there, now we're gonna see like, you know, what might a more systemic approach look like? So Kettleman City is a predominantly Spanish speaking agricultural unincorporated township in California's San Joaquin Valley. It is also one of the founding sites of environmental justice due to their successful fight against siting of a waste incinerator there. Um, I'll add that they also do have a hazardous waste landfill, class one hazardous waste landfill there already. Um, and it's also a um, site with many other pollutants. In fact, you know, some could go so far as to call this that, that it is a toxic landscape. Um, even there's only 1500 people that live there, but these 1500 people are exist at the intersection of two major highways, I-5 and California 41. They're surrounded by industrial agriculture. Um, this class one hazardous landfill that I mentioned, um, residents there have, this is, this is where like the worst of the worst hazardous waste gets disposed, like waste from oil production processing sites. And um, they, they will, the, Residents there have counted hundreds and hundreds of trucks coming through their community every day, carrying um, these pollutants. And so not only, and so even if these pollutants are contained, there is still the question of all of the diesel fumes being released um, by these, these trucks. There's, they also have a history of contaminated water with elevated concentrations of benzene and arsenic that exceed state standards. So along with having this, this very high level of toxins and contaminants in their, in their environment, this is also a community that has a high level of health inequities. Um, they um, have, this is a place that has higher rates of asthma, cancer, diabetes. Um, they also have less resources to healthcare. It's a small unincorporated town. Um, even if they want to engage in prevention um, or in sort of like say screenings um, that can help them to be alerted sooner if they are having a health issue, um, access to healthcare is incredibly difficult, not only because there's nothing there, but there's also often transportation difficulties that are compounding this. There's not exactly, there's not exactly bus routes coming through. There's not um, high levels of car ownership, multi multiple cars in a family, and so they may not even be able to get to appointments. 
So despite all of these challenges, um, as I said, this is a site of environmental justice where the company, where the, the um, community has come together um, and they have worked to address some of these issues. Um, and they are speaking out to say like, you know, we, we're not okay with the fact that we can't use our water for cooking, cleaning and bathing. Um, and they reached out to some researchers at UC Davis. They ended up working with a researcher here named Claire Cannon, um, who began talking with them about the type of research that they wanted done. So instead of her coming in and saying, okay, yeah, there's a lot of problems here. I'm gonna tell you what needs to happen. She sat down with them and said, what do you think needs to happen? And talking with them, um, they decided that they wanted to collect five types of data. They wanted to collect, um, and I'll kind of maybe move ahead so you can see these. Oops, oh no, I took that. Okay, anyway, I'll just kind of share this. So the, um, the five types of data they wanted collected was air samples um, and to look at air quality, um, water samples to look at what's in their water, biological samples, in this case, they wanted their blood test they want to know what's in their bodies. Um, and they also wanted to do a community health survey of all households in the town. And so this is what she did. Um, she um, started taking on this, this, these questions. It required um, a new type of research model, you know, that goes by various names. Um, she likes to call her research transdisciplinary. And we can see what, and I'll kind of say like how this works, because um, Dr. Cannon is trained as a geographer, um, and so she's not necessarily an expert in all of these areas that the community wants to explore. But what she is, is a person who is a UC Davis faculty, who can connect with other UC Davis faculty members and labs. So she was able to connect with um, the Air Quality Resource Center, or the Air Quality Research Center to engage in some air quality monitoring. She was able to engage in other um, research centers here to look at the chlorine byproducts in their, in their water um, with some labs here to examine this, this, the serum and, pla and plasma from volunteers. Um, and, and, then she was, but then, and then there was an environmental health survey which she could be expert in. So this is, this is a model that I really wanna you know, kind of highlight because what we see here is a model where we're not asking every researcher to become an expert in all these other areas. Instead, what we're doing is we're forming teams. She formed a team that included herself, but also mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering, public health, biostatistics, policy, and chemistry. Um, and that's what we need. But really crucial to this, and what I also wanna emphasize is the work she is doing is as a boundary spanner. She is a connector across boundaries. Uh, many of the researchers that she worked with could not necessarily have done this research with the community because it required a researcher who was really expert in how to do community engaged research. Um, the work she does is you know, incredibly time, time, um, time consuming, but ultimately it results in more impactful and accurate research because it's something that the community is highly invested in and are going to, um, to follow through on. So to just kind of like highlight, you know, some of the, you know, moving more towards like a summary, um, you know, I wanna review, we have these different ways of thinking about individual framing versus systemic framing that then can lead to different types of actions because ultimately, you know, that's what we all need is like, what do we do about this? One of the things we can do, as we said, is to pay atten attention to the politics of funding in one's field. Now, that's not necessarily something everyone can immediately do something about, but to notice um, how that works um, and to then have more, more um, agency to think about how one wants to negotiate their own career around that. Um, two, um, we can learn from and engage with health and environmental justice organizations. Um, in Dr. Cannon's case, you know, her research was being directed by an engagement with um, the knowledge that the env environmental justice groups in Kettleman City already had, um, and that has made her research that much more powerful. Um, we can also think about how we can create transdisciplinary teams in order to move more from, um, to give us more tools to 
prevent uncertainty from being exploited. And we can think about who we would invite in. Um, and of course, just like find other ways to ask different research questions that aren't currently being asked um, and you know, maybe driven by communities. Okay, so I'm gonna do another poll here. And um, this one's kind of a, a bit lengthy or very wordy, we'll say, a lot of options. Um, ooh, actually, I'm gonna make one change quick because I realized I didn't, I made that as a um, single choice. I want to change that so you can pick as many as you want. Okay, made that choice and um, launching this poll. So basically I'd like to hear, um, Based on what we've talked about, um, are there any of these actions below that you think you may be likely to take? Um, would you be likely to learn about funding distributions in your research field? Um, do you think you might want to engage in reflection or conversation about profit-driven research biases in the field? Um, in other words, you know, how are the, um, the need to, to create profit you know, from research outcomes maybe having an impact. Um, do you wanna think, do you wanna reflect on other questions that could be asked if we shift from thinking about the individual to environmental or systemic harm? Um, would you be interested in connecting with community organizations that are doing research? Um, because again, I, I, I didn't highlight this as much, but I wanna add that there are community organizations out there already doing their own research that would likely really appreciate um, partnering with the researchers who have more of the technical expertise and experience. Um, would you like to let the precautionary principle inform future research design? Are you interested in including social scientists in your research team, particularly those that may have experience with doing community engaged research? Um, something I didn't mention, but is another great thing to do is to include in your but include budget um, funds for community experts into your grants so that they um, can more fully participate in the research projects. And if you have other ideas, I'd love, you know, if people want to write that in the chat to share, that would be great. So I'll give that another minute. Um, and while I'm doing that, I'm going to um, present some of our discussion questions today. My inclination is that we'll probably all just stay in this room for discussion. We won't do a breakout. Um, and you all can, or actually, I think I may still do one breakout room. Um, no, I'll just keep us all in here. Sorry about that. Sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna make one breakout room for those that are gonna go into discussion. Um, and the questions that, and can I have um, one of our facilitators go ahead and copy these questions into the chat um, so that when you go into the room, you can still see them. Um, the questions um, that I want you to think about is like, is there a sort of like messy problem? Um, Cause that's really in a sense what we're talking about here is like, what type of messy problem would you like to solve that's beyond the scope of your current research? Or what new questions would you like to address? Um, and did you see ways that any of these tools here could help you? Um, we invite you to imagine like who would be like the dream team that we, you would need to address this problem. Um, and then what are helps and challenges to creating this team? And what skills and networks can you build now to work towards addressing this problem and creating a team to solve it? I also encourage you to think about how you can um, engage with um, what would it look like in your field to engage with the insert with with the precautionary principle or to address um, the, the exploitation of uncertainty in science in a more savvy way. 